eh, oggi Alfonso De Simone, che personalmente ancora e fisicamente soprattutto non conosco se non via, eh, via web. E Alfonso è professore ordinario di biologia molecolare al Dipartimento di Farmacia, cosa che per me professore ordinario di biologia molecolare alla Federico II è stata una sorpresa, non lo sapevo. E lui si è laureato in chimica a Napoli, poi ha fatto un dottorato in biologia e fisiologia molecolare e poi ha lavorato eh, in UK. Dal 2007 al 2011 ha lavorato all'Università di Cambridge dove ha fatto un postdoc. Dal 2011 al 2020 invece è stato un faculty al Dipartimento di Life Science dell'Imperial College, quindi una brillante diciamo, carriera all'estero, però un altrettanto brillante ritorno, di cui siamo felicissimi ovviamente, eh, come vincitore eh, di un grant ERC che credo, immagino, questo lo sto solo immaginando, gli abbia anche valso, eh, diciamo, gli abbia anche facilitato il cominciare, ricominciare una carriera in Italia. Eh, lui, eh, Alfonso, si occupa di disordine della struttura delle proteine a livello molecolare, ovviamente, e quindi anche di intrinsically disorder proteins. Eh, e eh, diciamo, penso che ci parlerà oggi sia di protein-protein interaction e protein-membrane interaction. E siccome nell'ultimo periodo mi sono interessata anch'io un pochino di, di queste cose, eh, sono veramente felice di ospitarlo qui eh, per un seminario anche se online. Quindi Alfonso io ti do la parola, grazie mille di, avere, di essere venuto, venuto <ride> virtualmente. Vabbè, virtualmente. Ok, um, I switch to English because there should be Thanks. some uh, international uh, people hopefully. Um, and, uh, so do you see my screen shared at the yes, moment? Yes, we do. And the presentation? Right, no, we do now. Perfect. Okay, great. So first of all, let me take the opportunity to thank you, uh, Katerina, for uh, giving uh, this talk. It's great to, to meet the community. And unfortunately, uh, as you were saying, I, I came back in, uh, uh, I came back from the UK and uh, it probably was not the right time to come back in, um, uh, both for setting a lab and, uh, and also for meeting people. But uh, anyway, so I think everybody has been affected by this uh, uh, pandemic situation. So um, we, we do what we can. Anyway, so um, the, the topic I wanna talk today is uh, uh, probably the key um, uh, biological part of, of my research interest, uh, which is uh, uh, about pro protein folding and misfolding. So uh, we know that uh, Proteins are uh, evolutionarily optimized to fold into a three-dimensional um, structure, which is the native state. And this happens uh, uh, immediately or even during the, the synthesis uh, uh, on the ribosome. Well, this is true for uh, probably 70 or 80 percent of the proteins, because now we know that uh, uh, a class uh, which is uh, relatively abundant of proteins is also intrinsically disordered. Therefore, they would never uh, have a three-dimensional structure and they would solve their function uh, as a disordered state. Um, so for decades, we have followed the paradigm that structure uh, leads to function. Um, but um, the, the, the key point is that not always uh, this uh, folding process uh, is successful. So when you start from a disordered state, an involved state, and then you, you go to the energy landscape into, into the minimum, uh, which is the native um, uh, state which has been encoded to be uh, functional and soluble and, and um, to avoid aggregation. In some particular cases, there could be some half pathway uh, intermediate state that is prone to the aggregation. And this intermediate state um, would lead to the formation of uh, um, amyloid fibers, um, which are very strong uh, fibular states of proteins. We share a lot of characteristics, including the uh, cross beta spine uh, structure. That means you have uh, an axis of the fibers which is orthogonal to the to the bit, uh, to the beta strands in in a virtually infinite beta sheet. Now, the interesting from medical point of view of these uh, amyloids is that they are associated to some of the most aberrant neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson, and prion diseases but also some non-neuropathic diseases like diabetes, diabetes type two. 
And here is a pictorial uh, um, um, drawing of a neuron, uh, which is all surrounded by these plaques. Uh, and that would be extracellular uh, uh, amyloids, like in the case of Alzheimer's. So the importance of these diseases is, uh, is strategic uh, these days. Now, uh, we, we know that these diseases are, um, have a, a greater uh, probability to, to start uh, with an aging um, population because uh, the probability of uh, uh, starting these processes increases with, uh, with, uh, with the age of uh, an individual. And then if we consider that uh, we are going toward uh, uh, an extension of life uh, expectancy. This is one of the uh, class of diseases that um, is predicted to have a great burden on the society in uh, 20, 30 years on. It is already a very great burden. Um, the disease I'm going to talk today is Parkinson's disease. Uh, this disease is uh, associated to the formation of intracellular inclusions um, called Lewy bodies. And these inclusions are primarily made uh, by uh, aggregates of a single protein, uh, which is called alpha synuclein, and it, it's the protein that we study primarily in my lab. Now, these aggregates occur in, in, in a particular region of the brain, the substantia nigra, uh, and uh, this region uh, um, is uh, full of dopaminergic neurons, which are um, neurons that exchange dopamine and are primarily um, uh, given the, the motor neuronal uh, uh, task. So in, in the case of Parkinson, um, the hampering of the correct transmission of dopamine uh, ends up with the phenotypes that we all know uh, and is uh, basically um, um, uh, given by these tremors and uh, rigidity of muscles. And, and it's a progressive disease that in the long run will also bring to dementia and eventually uh, other causes uh, um, uh, that, um, that become uh, uh, fatal in the end. So uh, these are the type of inclusions that you can find. Uh, the, the aggregation of alpha synuclein is not only uh, associated with, uh, with uh, Parkinson's disease, there are also other diseases uh, that uh, um, are um, future disaggregation like uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. And uh, they more or less uh, are all um, uh, associated by a common characteristics of these aggregates of uh, alpha synuclein and membranes primarily. So uh, a big question in the field is what's the function of this protein? Um, one of the, the main limitation is that we have discovered this protein in the context of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, so we, we know that uh, it, it's found in a, in uh, aggregates in Parkinson's, but in, and also um, uh, sometimes also in, in Alzheimer's context. Um, and, and therefore, so it has not been discovered for its function. And we are still uh, puzzled by what, what's the putative function of the protein. The protein itself is intrinsically disordered, is primarily located at the synaptic termini. Although this protein, you can find it in, in uh, um, many other type of cells. It's not only a neuronal protein, you can also find in red blood cells. Um, so there is a big, a big question of what, what's really the, the function of this protein. At the synapses, we have a certain uh, number of, of evidences that the protein is actually involved in a series of processes, like uh, it, it's believed to be a chaperone for the promotion of the snake complex and, and therefore for the exocytosis of synaptic vesicles. It has also been shown to, to promote the clustering of uh, synaptic vesicles. So, in such a way to regulate the homeostasis of, of these vesicles. But uh, there are also other putative functions. The protein has been uh, found in association with mitochondrial uh, membranes, with the nucleus. So th this big question mark of what, what's the real role of the protein. Um, when the protein is not in the physiological form, it, it starts to form aggregates. And these aggregates uh, have been shown to do all sorts of nasty things to, to neuronal cells. Uh, like breakage of mitochondria, breakage of the plasma membrane. Um, they can be exocytosed in a, in a sense, and there is also the idea that uh, you can spread the, the um, and we also have data for that, you can spread basically the, the, the um, neurodegeneration, the, 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 um, the toxicity from one neuron to another, also, also to glial cells. Um, 
In uh, my lab, we are pre primarily interested in uh, one particular interaction of alpha cell nucleus, which is the interaction between the protein and membrane. Uh, this is because the protein is um, uh, always found in equilibrium between a cytosolic soluble disorder state and a membrane associated state. Um, so this equilibrium is tightly regulated in, in, in uh, physiological conditions and is probably associated with um, most of the putative function of alpha synuclein. So if we, if we are to understand the function of synuclein, we have to know the, the bonding uh, to the membrane. The, we have to know the membrane bound state. Um, it is also a relevant interaction for the disease uh, part of the, of the protein. Um, for instance, the interaction with the membrane is a, a key interaction for oligomers of the protein, which are believed to be the most toxic species in the etiology of uh, synuclein opatis. But also membrane can template the fibrillization of the protein and membranes are always included in the inclusions. So um, it, it's an important um, intimate uh, interaction that uh, uh, has to be considered in the, in the whole uh, equation of alpha synuclein. So how does alpha synuclein bind uh, to membranes? So the protein in solution is intrinsically disordered. Um, but when it binds to the membrane, it starts to uh, adopt a, a certain level of structure. And, uh, and the structure is uh, in particular of a half a helical type. So the binding mechanism includes the folding of the protein uh, into half a helical stretch. Uh, and this is because there are a series of uh, uh, sequences, which are called uh, um, uh, amphipathic sequences, that encode for um, an amphipathic helix. That is a helix that has an hydrophobic side and hydrophilic side. So it's, it's ideal to bind hydrophobic surfaces uh, by putting the, the, the hydrophobicity, uh, hydrophobic part over the hydrophobic uh, surface and the hydrophilic parts over the solvent. And you can see this very easily. This is our CD spectra of synuclein. In the absence of any membranes, it's the typical random coil spectrum. But the more you pop into membranes, into solution, you start to see um, the formation of a strong illegal signal. Now, the presence of these repeats is uh, somehow scattered in the, into the sequence, and this allow, uh, allows a modular binding to membranes. And for this reason, synuclein is able to bind anything that goes from a monomer lipid to a planar lipid by, by ligand. So when we started uh, being interested in alpha synuclein, we were looking to the current structures of uh, um, uh, of this protein bound to something that could be uh, similar to a membrane. So you, you find these structures in the protein data bank, and these are micelle bound structures. So it's the structure of the protein bound to um, micellar uh, aggregates like SDS micelles. And I personally found that, that this, this type of interaction uh, could be uh, representative of something that might not really occur in the neuron because there is not something such a, a micelle at the synapse. So the structures were absolutely correct from the technical point of view, but perhaps uh, I thought we need to try to find a way to get a more, uh, a more uh, um, um, uh, physiologically relevant type of structural characterization. So there's been um, lots of studies. Uh, of course, you can do X-ray crystallography uh, in the presence of, of uh, biological membranes. Um, solution NMR can only uh, study small objects. That's why these structures were done with mice, because if you start to use uh, membranes or vesicles, they are too big for, for, for the solution NMR to be used. And EPR was uh, actually um, pretty much used to study the binding of synuclein to membrane, although this requires some modification of the protein, and this modification might be um, substantially affecting this type of interaction. So um, what we did, we tried to approach this, uh, this um, interaction uh, always from a uh, structural point of view, because that's uh, our primarily, uh, primary, primary interest. We are structural biologists. And we, we tried to find a, a technique that could help us to study the binding of uh, synuclein onto um, uh, planar lipid by layer. And in order to do that, we, we use solid state NMR. So now solid state NMR is a technique which is 
pretty much the same type of a technique of solution in MR. It's based on the same principles. Although it allows uh, to study um, solids, basically. And so it's a pretty much um, a powerful technique uh, used in material science. And in, uh, in protein science, it's, it's primarily um, a good way to study both amyloid fibers or uh, membrane proteins. So we so that that's basically our main um, um, our main uh, focus is to try to understand the, the conformation of the protein at the surface of, of biological membranes in order to provide information on the function and eventually also on on the putative uh, pathological role. Um, so the, the the first part of the talk will be about the the interaction of the monomeric. A physiological form of alpha synuclein with biological membranes in order to try to infer on possible mechanism of function. And the second part would be about the, the toxic, um, the toxic uh, aggregates and their interaction with membranes. So uh, our first study was done um, uh, in, uh, in Minnesota. We, we visited the University of Minnesota for, uh, for three summers because at the time uh, I didn't have a solid state MR in London. And this was between 2012 and 2014, uh, and we managed to achieve a way to study um, to study alpha synuclein at the surface of membranes. Now, this study was particularly challenging because uh, typically you need uh, proteins to be um, integral membrane proteins in order to start seeing signals. Whereas it looks like alpha synuclein is just like a, a transient binding to the membranes. It's probably part of its uh, biological role to bind a membrane, but also to, to unbind and go in, in binding something else. So the interaction has, is, is in, 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 intrinsically transient. So we managed to find a way to study this interaction and we basically could observe two uh, primary regions in the membrane bound state of the protein. An N-terminus uh, anchor, so that's the way we, we called it, um, an anchor to the surface. And this, this uh, N-terminus region was particularly rigid, um, such that it could come in a, in a, in a type of spectrum in a solid state, which is typically used to study transmembrane helices of uh, membrane proteins. And then we clearly saw a, a C-terminus region, which maintained all the features of uh, uh, intrinsically disordered protein. So from 98 to uh, 140, this region appear to be primarily disordered and not that much um, interacting with the, with the membrane surface. In the central region, um, we had a sort of like a dark spot because it, uh, it's a region that uh, we believe it's in, in equilibrium between a, a folded bound and a unfolded unbound conformation. Uh, and, and therefore, this conformation exchange is normally not very nice uh, in the NMR um, type of experiments. Although we could actually study this, uh, this region indirectly using the other techniques that, that I'll, I'll introduce. So three different regions, and they ha have different structural and dynamical and probably functional properties at the surface of lipid bilayers. Just to remind that we used uh, lipid bilayers, which were made of uh, synthetic lipids, they would uh, eventually uh, uh, um, mimic the whole lipid uh, composition of uh, synaptic vesicles. Uh, and of course, we were missing uh, um, all the rest of the proteins that were part of the synaptic vesicles. Uh, although in, in, in the next few slides, I will show some data made with the uh, ex vivo synaptic vesicles extracted by mouse brain, from mouse brain. Um, so, um, so what are these three regions? We, we further analyze the, the structural and functional role of these regions. So uh, let's start from the N-terminus. The N-terminus had the NMR spectra, which are typical of a very uh, folded uh, uh, half a helix. This is the uh, helical propensity based on the NMR uh, and the NMR data. Uh, we solved uh, its conformational state, which is primarily uh, um, a rigid alpha helix, uh, uh, well, um, well folded, in a sort of ideal alpha helix in equilibrium with some distorted uh, states, which are anyway uh, um, populated a low population. Um, another key 
uh, type of information that you can have from general NMR, but also from the solid state NMR is, is information about contacts. And I will just introduce uh, only these techniques just because uh, I will uh, show a lot of data um, of, of these techniques, which, which is called paramagnetic relaxation enhancement. So the idea is that you can have uh, a spin in whatever molecule it's in your sample. And this spin is basically an unpaired electron. Now, when you have an unpaired electron, in the radius of about 20 angstrom, all the nuclei that are around it are quenched from the NMR point of view. So that means that we lose information, we lose, um, we lose uh, uh, NMR signal um, in, a, in the radius of 20 angstrom. So this is a very powerful way to, to, um, to monitor contacts with, with, the, with the unpaired electron. So in the case of protein member interaction, we could actually use engineered lipids uh, and you only need like 1% of, of these lipids um, with the unpaired electron positioned in different parts of the lipid. And this is a great way to study the depthness of a particular molecule. So how deep this, uh, this molecule goes in, in the Z dimension of the lipid ballet. Is it on the top? does it go into the center of the membrane? So the idea is that when the, when the spin is on, you lose some of the resonances. And, and when the spin is off, and, you, and this is easy to, to put it off by reducing uh, agents, you, you, you restore all the resonances. So, so the blue spectrum here is a reference spectrum and each peak of, uh, on the spectrum are specific residues of a protein. And the red spectrum here overlapped with the reference is the, the, the spectrum in the presence of the spin. So all the peaks that have been quenched are uh, closer and closer to the spin. So this tells us where is a particular residue with respect to the spin. So when we use this for, for the binding of the antiminous regions, region of alpha synuclein to the membrane, we actually could uh, probe the, how deep this region goes inside the, inside the, um, the lipid bilayer. And, and this pointed out a very interesting data because he, he, he pointed out that there is a certain level of insertion of this antiminous anchor into the lipid bilayer, uh, which goes roughly up to the carbon five. So five, between five and 10 of the lipid. So uh, pretty much the, the top part of the hydrophobic uh, um, part of the membrane. Um, and imputatively, this insertion, this mild insertion, was able to, to provide, the, provide the, the, the ability to offer synuclein to anchor, be anchored with the, with the membrane, uh, but at the same time be sufficient uh, uh, close to the water uh, interface to eventually um, go away uh, when the protein has to be detached from the membrane. Because uh, as I said before, so the, the binding and bonding is, is equivalently important. So the unbinding of the protein from the membrane is, is probably key for the function. So this region enables to anchor the protein on the surface of the membrane, but in a reversible way. Um, Using the same type of experiment by putting the spins on the surface of the membrane, we could see that the C-terminal region which seems not really uh, associated with the membrane, it still has some transient contact. So there are some residues, and you can see some resonances here that uh, are quenched by the, by the paramagnetic uh, enhancement relaxation. That means that there are some transient contacts between, uh, um, between the, um, the, the tip of the protein and, and the surface of the, of, of the membrane. That probably has a relevance for the interaction with synaptic proteins, uh, because we know that this is the protein-protein interaction region of the protein. So the fact that the, uh, this region maintains a certain um, uh, contact, even transient with the, with, the, uh, with the membrane, means that the membrane helps the region to adopt the right conformation to bind other proteins uh, at the surface of synaptic visceral. Yet the, the most uh, relevant uh, probably uh, information we got on this C-terminal region is that it, it, it's a region that is able to bind calcium. Um, it binds calcium with a low affinity, uh, but, um, but it, it has some sort of uh, um, sensitivity to this, uh, to this ion. And we showed in synaptosome 
Uh, this work was done uh, in collaboration with my colleague uh, Gabi Kaminsky in, in Cambridge. We showed that uh, in the presence of calcium, synuclein um, becomes polarized and it, and it binds uh, very tightly in a synaptosome. It binds very tightly with synaptic vesicles uh, and particularly co-localizes with uh, VAMP2 or synaptobrevin2 uh, is the other name of this protein, which is one of the SNES uh, proteins. So that means that calcium is a sort of switch of, of alpha synuclein that changes it, its interaction with membrane and also its localization in synaptosome. So, so, so this identified a sort of a biological switch. And of course, calcium is a very important um, ion during the, the, um, uh, the trans neurotransmission uh, because when the action potential arrives, calcium a, a concentration in the active zone of the, of the, um, of the synapse increase uh, in, in a significant way. Um, the other region that we, we, we didn't manage to characterize by solid state um, is the central region. And this region is fundamental for both the aggregation and it ended up to be fundamental also for the membrane interaction. So um, we managed to study it in solution in MR, um, where we normally see just the unbound uh, state of alpha synuclein, but for some sort of a, a saturation uh, um, technique, uh, a sort of fret technique, uh, uh, equivalent of fret into the NMR, we could see um, um, the actual strength of binding at a, re a residue specific level. So I won't go into the details of this uh, technique, but I will just tell you that basically it's a saturation technique. And the, the more saturated is uh, um, a particular um, residue, the, the, the tighter is the binding with the membrane. Um, and so this is done in solution. And you can see how a, a solution uh, in the absence of, uh, of um, any membrane gives like a flat saturation curve. Uh, in the presence of the membrane, we could see again the, the tight binding of the N terminus, the, uh, non, the, the, the negligible binding of the C terminus. And we could actually show the profile of this, of this uh, central region, which shows in the presence of synaptic like vesicles it shows this, this like of, uh, uh, of shape. So by, um, by looking at this shape, we could actually uh, understand a lot of things. Um, uh, like uh, for instance, the fact that this region is actually uh, very sensitive to the type of composition of the membrane. So if you change the membranes uh, from uh, uh, the synaptic like uh, uh, composition to a very ac acidic composition, this region starts to bind more tightly. Whereas the other two regions, the, the strong N terminus and the, and the weak C terminus, they remain roughly the same. So we, we denominated the central region as a sensor of the, of the, of the membrane uh, in interaction, uh, uh, which somehow is able to distinguish between two different membranes and, this, and decide what's the strength of binding of the whole protein to the, to the membrane surface. So, um, after this initial study, we decided to study some pathological mutation. Now, there are lots of uh, Mendelian uh, point mutation uh, associated with Parkinson, and of course, there are also mutation into the gene that express alpha synuclein. The ones that are currently uh, most um, uh, acknowledged um, are uh, not that many. So these are mutation in alpha synuclein, and they all go into the membrane binding region. So the region, and particularly in the central region, so this, uh, this region that I showed you to, to be like modularly um, uh, sensitive of the membrane interaction. Um, so we study uh, two particular uh, mutations because they have two opposite sides to, to, the, um, to, the, to the membrane binding. The A30P uh, almost abolish the, the membrane interaction and the E46K increases strongly the membrane interaction. So uh, I, I won't show all the spectra we, we managed to collect both in, in solution and solid state in MR, but I just wanna say that the final outcome of this investigation was that uh, we figured out that the N-terminal binding and the C-terminal binding were pretty much independent among each other. So by changing the, the, the interaction strength associated uh, to this mutation, um, basically, they, the, two, the two ends of the protein were 
were remaining roughly uh, independent and insensitive to changes to the to to the sequence uh, properties or the pruning. Um, this led us to uh, to propose a, a model in which if the two regions uh, like the the N-terminal region and the region that goes from residue 65 to 97, um, the two regions of, of alpha synuclein are basically binding membranes in an independent way. They are not necessarily binding the same membrane, but they can actually bind across two different types of membranes. And this, this model uh, was uh, denominated by us as a double anchor mechanism. So you have a, a first anchor, which is the stronger, strongest anchor of the protein at the end terminus, and then you have a second anchor, a weaker anchor, um, which eventually can most of the time bind on the same membrane surface, but sometimes it can bind also to another membrane. And this would eventually promote the uh, interaction between two different vesicles in this case, promoted by alpha synuclein. So we postulated this hypothesis uh, and uh, um, it, this model is actually in line with a lot of biological data, which I don't have time to, to um, to, to show you, but, but I have time to somehow uh, show you the way by which we proved, that, or at least we, we, we generated evidences uh, that evidence that this model is actually uh, correct. So the idea is that uh, a single alpha synuclein protein can bind across two different membranes in such a way as forming a sort of glue between membranes. And in, in the particular case of synaptic vesicles, this might be relevant to promote the clustering or clustering of the vesicles. Here is a review uh, between, uh, from Susan Lindquist, uh, which, um, which uh, was actually uh, putting forward this idea. And, and it's actually known biologically, as I say, that uh, synuclein can help the clustering of the membrane. So our idea is that it does it through this uh, uh, molecular mechanism. So how did we prove this? Um, so first of all, it's just to say that uh, you can do a very simple experiment. If you have uh, like a vesicles in solution, these are uh, lipid vesicles of the composition of the synaptic uh, part of the, the, the membrane part of the synaptic vesicles. And, and if you put them in solution, you, you, you can find them uh, isolated. These are cryo-EM uh, uh, images. But the, the moment you start putting synuclein in, you will see the, the, the vesicle quickly uh, binding among each other, and in, in, in this particular case, they will start to fuse because these are just simple membranes. So we use this uh, fusion as a sort of indication of uh, how strongly alpha synuclein can promote the interaction between, uh, between uh, membranes. So in order to prove our mechanism, we decided to design a, a, um, a rational design of a, of a mutant in which um, we, we promote more strongly the exposure of the second anchor um, from the surface of, of a vesicle. And we counterbalance this with, with, uh, with uh, an increase in, in the binding strength of the, of the end terminus. Now, um, the, the mutant that we propose is a swapping mutant in which you, 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 you bring the uh, E46 to position 80 and the K4080 uh, into position 46. So, so the overall uh, sequence of the protein, uh, the overall uh, amino acid composition of the protein remains the same. The net charge is the same. And, and we proved that the binding affinity with the membranes of the mutant and the wild type remain the same. The only difference is the structure at the surface of the, of the, uh, of the vesicle in which this particular region, the second anchor is more um, uh, protruded toward the solvent. And because we, we think that this act as an antenna to capture another membrane, we postulated that this mutant would be more prone to induce vesicle-vesicle um, -vesicle interaction um, in, into this model. So, uh, um, so we, we, we could have done this by CRIM, but you don't have enough statistics. So in order to get more statistics, we use a super resolution uh, microscopy um, through the, our collaboration with Gabi Kaminsky. And uh, here are stat data. Uh, uh, every single dot of here is uh, it, it, it's a vesicle and, and we could, um, it's, it's enough resolve to, to, to get the radius of the vesicle. So we started from a size distribution of around, uh, of around uh, uh, 60 nanometers. 
in the presence of wild type alpha synuclein, we observed a new population of fused vesicles. And these come from the fact that synuclein promotes the interaction between vesicles. But our mutant, we was, which was postulated to, to, to do the, the double anchor mechanism in a stronger way, was uh, able to uh, uh, increase the amount of, uh, of fusion events, um, both in terms of uh, quantity and also in terms of the, of the resulting sites of these vesicles. Then we wanted also to prove this with the real synaptic vesicles, because you know, a real synaptic vesicles is made of a membrane and also a lots of proteins on the surface of it. So we extracted the uh, synaptic vesicles from, from mouse brain and, and did roughly the same experiments. Um, in this particular case, we, we had to use a D-storm because we needed more brightness um, of the vesicles. The vesicles are labeled with a, with a chromophore that binds membranes and, and becomes um, fluorescent, but of course, um, it, it is not extremely strong when you use this ex vivo material. So we had to use this storm. So this is the, the typical this storm image of uh, our ex vivo synaptic vesicles. And this is in the presence of, of uh, alpha synuclein wild type. And here is in the presence of, uh, of alpha synuclein design mutant, what we call the swapped mutant. And, and in, in the statistical analysis, it came out that the mutant is more prone to generate large clusters of synaptic vesicle. So this corroborated our model of the double anchor. So in general, uh, our results on, on, the, on the monomeric alpha synuclein were pretty much um, to, to show that the equilibrium and the dynamics uh, order to disorder uh, transition of the membrane bound state uh, of the protein. The double angle mechanism in, by which alpha synuclein will contribute to the formation of reserve pools, which are important in the whole homeostasis of, of the synaptic vesicles. And also the fact that calcium, calcium would, would, would actually modify the binding properties um, uh, on the surface of these synaptic vesicles. So we, we recently also interrogated of what happens with the, with the plasma membrane of the, pro, uh, of the, of the neuron. That synuclein also bind in this region uh, and have, um, uh, have some role at the synaptic, uh, uh, synaptic uh, membrane, um, the presynaptic membrane. So we, we started recently the, the binding uh, to, to the presynaptic membrane. So this presynaptic membrane is totally asymmetric. We have different composition from, from the internal size and the external side. Again, we, we use uh, uh, synthetic uh, vesicles, uh, synthetic membranes made uh, with synthetic lipids that uh, mimic the composition of, of the, the presynaptic membrane. And what we found is that synuclein doesn't really bind. So these are binding curves made by solution NMR. That doesn't really bind both at the end terminus and the, and the central region, the, the, the second anchor. It doesn't really bind um, uh, strongly the external part of the presynaptic membrane. However, it binds the internal part with a, 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 a very good uh, affinity. So there is an asymmetric um, binding also by synuclein that reflects the different composition of the presynaptic membrane. Um, the other big thing is that the, mem in, in ten, uh, the plasma membrane bound state has a different conformation with respect to the synaptic vesicle state. And in particular, we were puzzled by the fact that uh, the, the, the central region, uh, so the second anchor in the double anchor mechanism, is almost not bound, bound into the uh, pre internal synaptic membrane. So it looks like this region is extremely um, uh, protruded toward the, the solvent when the protein binds to the pre membrane. And therefore, the, we, we said, well, if it is like that, the, the double anchor mechanism might work even more strongly when, when synuclein binds the, the internal plasma membrane uh, with respect to, to when it binds to synaptic vesicles. So we postulated that in addition to promoted, promoting the interaction between vesicles in the clustering, it might also help the docking of an individual synaptic vesicle on the surface of the, the plasma membrane, internal surface. And this docking is fundamental because that's the process by which then a synaptic vesicle do the exocytosis and release the neurotransmitters which are uh, important for neuronal communication. So our model 
um, was modified uh, and is still like a double anchor mechanism in which you have the anti-aminous binding, the plasma membrane here as a flat surface and the, and the central region binding the synaptic vesicles. And in this way, it will help stabilizing the, the surface of the vesicles. So this will pr probably um, could be a model in which uh, um, alpha synuclein can help the so-called kiss and run mechanism. So now we know that there is a principal mechanism of exocytosis in which um, the, the vesicles come from the pools, they come to the active zone of the neuron, and they will eventually fuse as a result of the, of the snare, snare complex. Um, and, and this is probably the employed the, for the majority of the, of the process of exocytosis. However, there is another mechanism, which there is a lot of evidence in literature, which is a fast pulsing uh, mechanism. It's called a kiss and run. And it's a mechanism in which the, the, the vesicle do not really fuse completely with the, with the plasma membrane. They would eventually come dock uh, open a pore, release some of the neurotransmitter, and then go quickly back into, into the circuit to be reloaded and then going back to the, to, to the, to the uh, really uh, releasable pool. So this mechanism of fast pulsing is actually very um, uh, likely to happen in uh, fast pulsing neurons like like the dopaminergic neuron. So, so we postulated and uh, that the eventually this binding uh, of a synuclein to the plasma membrane and the vesicle can help into this mechanism. Of course, this requires further um, biological investigation, but we wanted to actually prove that um, synuclein can help the docking of synaptic vesicles on the, on the surface of the plasma membrane. And we did this using a, a turf microscopy. So turf microscopy enables to have a focal plane of about 150 nanometers. So what we put on the microscope uh, glass surface, we put like uh, um, uh, the composition of the plasma membrane uh, in an unlabeled way. So this becomes invisible to the, to the turf because there is no floor force on that. And then we floated in the sample some uh, membranes uh, um, uh, of, the, of the composition of synaptic vesicles with a fluorophore inside, so, so that they could be seen in a, um, a fluorescence microscope. And basically the idea is, okay, so you will start seeing event of a docking of these vesicles uh, in a stochastic way into the focal plane, but what happens if I add alpha synuclein? Do, do I see more um, docking of, of the vesicle on the, on the plasma membrane? And then basically, this is the way the, 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 um, the imaging work. And, and then we can do videos of, of these. So they would tell us information about residence time of vesicles on the surface of the plasma membrane. So, so on, the, on, the, on, on the basis of the, uh, of the image, there is plasma membrane. And these dots are the synaptic vesicles going on the surface and just uh, um, sampling uh, some interaction with the plasma membrane. And what we show that uh, the, if you go from, from no synuclein to 10 micromolar to 100 micromolar, you see an increase of the docking events on the surface of the plasma membrane. And also, alpha synuclein changes also the residence time. So that means that the, the, the vesicles are more likely to stay there in the presence of alpha synuclein than going away. So this showed that basically there is a, um, a, eventually a, um, an um, effect in which synuclein might promote transiently the stabilization of the vesicles on the surface of the plasma membrane. And eventually this could come as a, as a, a potential um, a functional role. So just to, to summarize our, our results is uh, again, so the binding to the membrane, the, the, the clustering, um, the, the binding to the to calcium and eventually the the, um, the uh, helping of the of the docking of the vesicle on the plasma membrane. So if I have other uh, other five minutes, I, I show also the dark side of the pruning, and that is when synuclein starts to uh, aggregate into oligomers, uh, and these oligomers are initially uh, aggregates amorphous; they maintain the disordered nature of the pruning. And eventually they would convert into fibrillar species, still of oligomeric sites. And we know from a lot of literature in the amyloid field uh, on all the systems that when the aggregates are um, uh, small and diffusible, they, they do harm much more strongly the neuronal cells and cellular uh, cells in general.
So these prefibular oligomers are those that are able to, to break the plasma membrane and cause calcium influx. They could also break mitochondria and, and cause the, the release of cytochrome C and therefore signaling for apoptosis. And then they eventually will they will uh, evolve into into mem into fibers. So now the the knowledge of the fibers is becoming much more um, consolidated uh, recently. We we had an explosion since 2016 of the fibrillar uh, structures of uh, of uh, alpha synuclein, but there is lots to know about the oligomers. So the oligomers are very elusive species. They form and they dissolve and they evolve, so they are transient species, so they are very difficult to, to be studied. And therefore, um, and they are also very heterogeneous. There are lots, there is a lot of disorder in these species, so it's difficult to study them with any technique like um, uh, crystallography, cryem, and even NMR. So what we did, we studied two types of oligomers. Uh, the initial oligomer that starts forming immediately after synuclein starts to self-assemble. This disorder oligomer is believed to be not very different from the monomer in terms of toxicity properties. Now, this oligomer can follow the pathway, the yellow pathway, forming a nucleus of fibers, which, evident, uh, which very quickly will evolve into, into a fibular species. However, the same oligomer can go sometimes half pathway, be trapped into a prefibular species, which will take a lot of time to convert into the fibular nucleus and then evolve into the fiber. So this prefibular species is the ideal killer for the, for the, for the neuron because it's stabilized, is able to go around in the, in, in the cell and has all the characteristics of generating toxicity. So we wanted to figure out what, what's the feature of this oligomer. So in order to do that, we had to stabilize them in a sufficient time and, and also quantity to be started using the solid state. To stabilize um, the, the non-toxic species, we used this uh, epicallocatechin gallate, which, is, which was known to trap uh, disorder proteins in a sort of um, uh, vitrified uh, disorder state uh, of oligomer. Whereas for the kinetically trapped uh, structure oligomers, we use a protocol that is based on, is based on uh, um, life utilization step and incubation. So we could use these uh, two types of oligomers and we call them type A and type B. A because forms before is the first step and B uh, forms as a second step and star because they are stabilized. So the type B stars, um, uh, when incubated with neuronal cells, are extremely toxic. So we, we found uh, a reduction in the mitochondrial function. This is a, a typical MTT uh, assay for mitochondrial uh, function. They cause a sudden increase into reactive, reactive oxygen species in the neuron. Um, and you can see that uh, either the monomer or, or the fibers or the type A Oligomers, they don't do that in, in, the, in the way it, uh, the type B, the toxic oligomers do. And the same thing also, the, 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 the big difference which we were interested in is that the type A non-toxic oligomers, they do not really harm the mitochondrial function as much as the type B oligomers. So, so they look to be good uh, candidates to be compared in terms of structure and, and figuring out what was the, the, uh, the origin of the toxicity of the oligomers of alpha now, now, recently, uh, in collaboration with the Anna Carta group in Cagliari, we, we started to infuse the toxic oligomers in mouse brain. So they were infused unilaterally in the substantia nigra of the mouse. And then and we, we, we followed the, the evolution of, uh, along months in the, into the mouse properties. And basically what we found is that uh, the infusion of non-phosphorylated uh, exogenous oligomers generated a huge deposition of endogenous alpha synuclein, so mouse alpha synuclein, which is very similar in sequence to the human one uh, in the substantia nigra, and also microglia, uh, 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 and also it spread it to the striatum. And then it, we found uh, a near inflammation, which is persistent. Uh, in the substantia nigra, and then other effects of, uh, of, uh, of neurodegeneration, like uh, mitochondrial loss uh, in, in uh, substantia nigra neurons, uh, nigrostrial dopamine, dopaminergic loss, and motor cognitive impairment. So we think that 
these oligomers are great models for the toxic species that you find in Parkinson. And these help us to generate this mouse model of Parkinson. So uh, our final goal was to see, okay, we have these two oligomers, can we study their structure? And we tried to do that by NMR. So these are the NMR spectra of the non-toxic and toxic uh, oligomers. These are the core of the oligomers. These are the disorder region of the oligomers. And we found that basically, there is a big difference in the, in the composition of the oligomers. The non-toxic have a core which is primarily made of the N-terminus and a disorder region, which is at, uh, probably at the surface of the, of, the, of the oligomers, which is made primarily of the C-terminal region and the, and the amyloidogenic NAC uh, region. Whereas the, the toxic one were pr primarily formed of a fibrillar core in the amyloidogenic NAC region and they would expose both the N-terminus and the C-terminus in a disordered way. So uh, in addition to uh, being toxic, they bind membranes and they also disrupt membranes. So here is an, an assay in vitro uh, in which you load the vesicles with calcium and then you incubate with whatever you want. And then you, if you see release of calcium, you, you see fluorescence. And this is a very established method for studying antimicrobial peptides, for example. And then basically we showed that the toxic oligomers were binding vesicles and, dis and disrupting them and having the release of calcium. A very same experiment could be done in neuronal cells. Now, uh, I forgot to say that the, the, the striped bars here are primary cortical neurons and the, and the field bars are neuroblastoma cells. So we did this, this experiment and they were done in Florence with our collaborator Fabrizio Ghidi um, by Roberta Cascella and they basically are experiments in which we incubate the oligomers with the, with, the, with, the, with the neurons and see the effect. In this case, we could see that uh, toxic oligomers will, will, uh, will bind the fibers. Uh, Karina, do you have a, another five minutes or, or should I stop you? For me, this is very interesting. I hope that we can uh, also uh, arrive other five minutes. Okay, good, Thank, thanks a lot. So what happens is that the toxic oligomer, they bind and disrupt membranes, whereas the non-toxic one, they, they don't disrupt membranes. We had evidence that they also bind membranes, but they don't disrupt membranes. So they don't create holes in the membranes. So what was the, the mechanism? So we used NMR to figure out that the non-toxic oligomers would bind the membrane in a sort of random way with sequences that are spread throughout the N-terminal uh, binding region, where this toxic one, we're binding very specifically with the N-terminus um, in an alpha helical um, uh, adopted conformation once they bind the membrane. And then eventually uh, they would, uh, I, I skip just to the final mode, they would eventually break the membrane by inserting their um, um, hydrophobic uh, structure core into the membrane. So this is the, the event that basically generates holes in the membrane and then generates calcium influx or disrupts mitochondrial membranes. So um, can we use these mechanisms to stop this toxicity? And we've done this uh, again with a better Gashella in Florence by uh, looking into um, into potential ways to stop this mechanism. So, so we knew that there were uh, these initial steps of binding the membrane with the N-terminus. So we said, if I use something that blocks this N-terminus, I can prevent the whole mechanism of toxicity of toxic oligomers. And therefore we use the, um, as a proof of principle an N-terminal binding antibody and compare these effects to the C-terminal binding antibody. And we could see that both the, the membrane disruption was almost restored if you incubate the oligomers with the N-terminal binding antibody. And then eventually, eventually also um, the, the, the membrane binding itself was uh, almost disrupted with this N-terminal binding antibody. Mitochondrial function was almost restored and also the, the reactive oxygen species activity of the oligomers is almost abolished by the use of the N-terminal antibody. So that means that if you use this uh, structure-based approach, you can design potential drugs to stop the aggregation, uh, stop the, the toxicity. So as a final proof, we, we, we said, okay, let's see if uh, what happens with that antibody in an in vivo, in vivo model. So there are very nice models of Parkinson, uh, well, not actually Parkinson, but alpha-synuclein toxicity. Uh, and one of them is 
actually the CE elegans, which is a beautiful um, way to study biology. So basically these worms uh, have been engineered to overexpress alpha synuclein bound to, to YFP in order to form to follow by fluorescence. And basically when you when you have the the the, the alpha synuclein overexpression, the, the life of these uh, these um, uh, worms is much more uh, short, is shorter. So what they do basically, they paralyze the worms and then therefore the worms, they are not really able to, to, to search for food. So what we did, we, we, we incubated the worms with both the C-terminus, the control antibody and the N-terminus. And we actually, we, we, we actually saw that the N-terminus was able to uh, reduce significantly the amount of aggregation into the worm. And eventually all the fitness parameters in the presence of these N-terminus antibodies were basically restored. So that means that our in vitro exp experiment was actually then able to be reproduced in vivo in an in vivo model of alpha synuclein aggregation. And I leave you with this final video in which I show you these, these worms. So we have the, the, the control worms just expressing YFE and they are healthy and happy. So they swim in, into the well in order to search for food. And uh, you can see this is the, the healthy phenotypes. When you express uh, YFE plus alpha synuclein, the worms become paralyzed. So now you can see some of them seem seems probably dead. Others are still moving, but in a much more reduced way. But when you add an antiminous antibodies in the in the well, when they start to go, basically it was able to restore the mobility so the so, such that that reduced the, the, the toxicity of alpha synuclein. So uh, uh, in conclusion, these are the, the, the things that we have been studying so far. Now we, we will want to focus a bit more in a, in a way to find the molecules to, to stop this, this process. And also there is a lot to do, in my opinion, still on the fibrillar side. We have a lot of structures now, but there is a lot to understand in the biological side. So in conclusions, so the membrane interaction is a fundamental interaction in alpha synuclein biology. Uh, and my PowerPoint is actually just um, crashed. Uh, crashed. Uh, I will just like put the, the final slide because it's important to acknowledge people. I uh, apologize about this. Uh, where, where is the, the PowerPoint? Okay. Anyway, so uh, I put the, the, the yes, just the, the final acknowledgement. Uh, I, I don't want to. Um, forget to acknowledge people. So um, my, my key collaborators in these old studies uh, are in Florence, for Bitsipiti, Roberta, Garcella, Gianluigi Veglia in Minnesota, where we started doing this NMR of Sinuclei, Gabi Caminsi for super resolution, Michele for a lot of biophysical things, Liming also for, for resolution, and Anna, Anna Carta Group for, for, the, uh, for the mouse. So now most of all, the, all this work was done uh, by Juliana Fusco, which is now a um, fellow in Cambridge. And, and uh, let me just remind my, my great mentor, Chris Dobson, which uh, has participated to most of this work, um, unfortunately died uh, two years ago. And, and uh, I had the fortune to, to, to be his friend and, and he was my mentor for 12 years and probably has uh, influenced my whole life and my whole career. And just like also um, a, a many thanks to Imperial College, which has been a wonderful loss institution in the last 10 years. And, and all, the, all the different uh, um, funding agency, particularly ERC now uh, that are funding my lab. Thank you for your time. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for uh, the beautiful talk. Very, very interesting. So, um, so we are now can uh, ask questions by raising hands. And I will switch to Italian just to facilitate the questions. Quindi, se, of course, you're very welcome to, to ask questions in English as well. Quindi, se vogliamo fare domande, eh, potete alzare la mano eh, oppure anche scriverle eventualmente nella chat se non volete parlare direttamente. Vedo che c'è una domanda. Quindi, comincio a dare la parola ad Alessandro Faldi che ha una domanda. Um, Devi... Ok. Alessandro, uh, dovresti essere in grado di parlare, però hai il microfono muto, apparentemente. Eh, ecco, adesso? Ok, perfetto. Ok. So, uh, 
Alfonso, thank you very much. This is very interesting talk. Uh, so my question is about uh, the, um, so the mechanism that we have shown for, uh, for alpha synuclein. So uh, to, to what extent uh, this mechanism <coughs> is, uh, is common to other um, aggregate from protein? So I'm thinking in particular to, C, to CSP alpha. Yeah. Uh, because CSP alpha is, uh, it's is, is a co-chaperon yeah. so of synaptic recycling and it's also involved in disease. So it's Absolutely. basically is able to, to form oligomers and... Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I don't know exactly about uh, CSP alpha oligomers, but um, in a sort of like transversal uh, type of analysis, uh, in particular with my friend and collaborator Fabrizio in Florence, Fabrizio Chiti, we have analyzed uh, so far a large number of different type of oligomers, just uh, a synuclein, but also a beta from Alzheimer, um, a T TDP43, now we are working into, into a ALS, and also some molder proteins, so proteins that are not really associated with uh, um, with uh, neurodegenerative diseases, but are anyway uh, able to form uh, oligomers and, and and to be toxic to neurons. And, and the idea is that the toxicity uh, that come out, uh, so uh, so there is a, a general probably the general mechanism, uh, and this is something where uh, half of the literature, a little bit more than half of the literature, is is agreeing is the binding to the membrane and disruption of the membranes. There are also some ideas about receptor mediated toxicity, mm -hmm. uh, which is also um, true and it is also being shown by alpha and cyanogreen as well. But I think it's probably a combination of both. And in the terms of membrane disruption, we found a lot of common characteristics. Mm -hmm. Probably the hydrophobicity has been the one that uh, uh, the, the, the type of uh, parameter that better correlated with all the different oligomers. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. So thank you. So it's very and another very short question. So uh, so the um, ability of alpha synuclein to to bind membrane and uh, to to uh, disrupt the uh, membrane is uh, how this is related to the dual uh, anchor mechanism that is more related maybe to the physiologic function if i understand yeah i mean the the at least in the oligomers we have found that, um, the second anchor uh, of the double anchor is uh, embedded in the core of the of the oligomer so the second anchor is actually not anymore helical but it's actually of beta sheet type Mm -hmm. and, and this is typical of with these, these older proteins, they are metamorphic, they can adopt different. I mean, synuclein by, adopts the alpha helical uh, uh, in the membrane bound state, the disordered in solution, and the beta sheet in the fibrillar state. So it's basically probably a protein that can do, go to the whole protein space very easily. So this second anchor is uh, actually part of the core that then binds the membrane and disrupts it. So in a sense, it is employed in the disruption model, but uh, by adopting a different type of conformation, not monomeric, uh, not helical, but uh, oligomeric and fibrillar and beta sheet. So they, it is actually also employed, but uh, uh, in, a, in a different way. And that's probably the, the, the fact, I mean, so my personal opinion, and we have wrote this in, uh, in a review, is that the, the, the center region, which is then used also for, uh, for um, for the uh, amyloidogenic state is actually very promiscuous and it, it likes to interact with a lot of things like uh, the, the membranes, uh, other proteins and hydrophobic things. So, so um, putatively, um, this region has been designed to be in this way, has evolved to be in this way for, for the promiscuous function that alpha synuclein has in binding different membranes with different proteins uh, in a sort of transient way, not really tight binding and, and on and off binding. It's always, uh, there's always like a competition with different partners. Um, but probably the promiscuity is then detrimental in the condition leading to the aggregation, which could be either overexpression of the protein for gene duplication, triplication, or even other uh, effects and therefore, this then becomes negative when, when you start to do the aggregation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alessandro. Grazie. Qualche altra domanda? Ah, ecco. Uh, Francesco Salvatore, Franco. Uh, 
Franco, uh, prego, dovresti accendere il uh, microfono. Eccoti qua. Thank you. Uh, I'm Salve, off. I'm, uh, I thank you first and uh, I'm off. I'm, uh, I regret uh, myself to make this question because I was late in connecting you with your okay. seminar since uh, I was uh, obliged to be in another uh, seminar uh, in, uh, at the national level. However, I would like just, I don't know if I can make this question, uh, which is, uh, a, since I am interested in very early diagnosis uh, mm. of uh, any kind of chronic degenerative disease, uh, I would like to know if uh, I heard a seminar and a, was a, a congress in, a, in dementia, in dementia field, and uh, I heard that uh, <clears throat> people may uh, find the signs or symptoms even 30 years before the clinical, uh, what they call preclinical, I don't agree with that, but anyway, in the clinical field, 30 years before. I wonder if also in Parkinson, you have uh, noticed that uh, there are early signs or symptoms uh, that can be approached uh, uh, after such uh, a, a, or maybe even less uh, years before the clinical appearance. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly, I wonder if, uh, a, in a kind of sense of uh, system medicine, how physical exercise can give, uh, in your opinion or your knowledge about the uh, specific uh, physical exercise, maybe contribute to the prevention uh, very early uh, in this kind of disease. It's an excellent question. Um, uh, okay, so the, about the second part of the question about the physical exercise, uh, there has been a, a large scale uh, screening. Uh, um, it was not only focusing on, um, on uh, Parkinson, but also Alzheimer, which they are very, very similar disease yeah. type. And they found actually no correlation at all in general. The only big correlation they found is about the food and having an healthy uh, type of food, uh, uh, let the, um, yeah, so, so like a Mediterranean uh, food as, as usual, uh, ended up to be a very good uh, um, uh, factor to, to reduce, to delay the, 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 um, the, the, the insurgence of the symptoms. Um, I, I suppose exercise is always good because, uh, of course, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're not healthy in your body, then you start to uh, accumulate a lot of uh, free radicals and, and, and we have seen that there the, like the oxidation of these proteins is a big trigger for, and also the oxidation of the membranes is a big trigger for these uh, diseases and for these mechanisms. So of course the, the, the making the body clean and um, having a healthy life is certainly a good thing. But food seems to be uh, one of the, the, the few correlation they could find uh, and of course, we need more data, and uh, with the artificial intelligence, this will become uh, in the in the next few years more and more clear. Uh, the other question about diagnosis, um, that's a big point because, uh, um, of course, the, the, the uh, so it's a progressive disease. So, so it could be uh, if we find the right marker, we can actually uh, diagnose it uh, much earlier than the big insurgence of the plaques. Now. With the MRI, you can actually distinguish these plaques uh, quite significantly. Uh, with uh, you know uh, blue cells, uh, type of MRI, uh, there is now the clear signature that can tell us uh, if you have this accumulation of amyloid fibers. Whereas in the past, you had to wait for post mortem to to figure out if it was an amyloidogenesis of the neurodegenerative disease. But the big uh, the big um, detection, I think, it would be right on the oligomers. Because actually the oligomers are the biggest toxic species in the etiology of these diseases. And uh, um, there has been a lot of confusion in literature because uh, uh, also pharmaceutical company, they found uh, molecules, they could uh, get rid of the fibers, but the disease was still there. So they started to question the hypothesis of the amyloid. Um, however, um, to my opinion, and, and many others in the field, is that it is not actually the amyloid that is what we have to look at, but it's these oligomers. So they can form even in the absence of uh, a lot of accumulation of amyloids. 
So we need um, uh, diagnostic tools to to uh, to 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 trigger uh, to identify these oligomers, and that that would be a big change in the diagnosis. You cannot say just to continue the question. You, you can't uh, make prediction how many years before the clinical appearance. That was essentially my question. There is any kind of, uh, because now people, uh, medical uh, uh, people are not uh, convinced uh, to, to make, uh, uh, to make, uh, uh, let's say tests or analysis or even MRI very early, except yeah. maybe in case where uh, there is a, a familial- uh, Aggressive uh, forms in the yeah, familial so, case. Uh, uh, what do you think? In the, uh, there have been found uh, this uh, kind of um, maybe uh, amyloid uh, aggregates or whatever it tells uh, in, uh, in the urine of patients very early. If you look for nat naturally, you don't find exactly. it in routine yeah, yeah. analysis. Because, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, for cardiotoxicity, we have found uh, yeah. the, the, the light chain. Uh, Light chain, uh, amyloid, light chain yeah. antibody in uh, yeah. which uh, have, uh, yeah no I think I think early uh, signs of the disease early signs of this yeah. I mean, I think, for instance, a protein like alpha synuclein, you, you find it just in the red blood cells normally. So uh, it's, not, um, it's not like th that confirmation, the function of a confirmation, uh, you need to distinguish between confirmation. So we need confirmational specific uh, uh, tools to do this uh, type of analysis. And they are very difficult to, to, to create. For instance, uh, in the literature, there's been this idea of uh, uh, confirmational specific antibodies which were tackling uh, just the oligomers because that's the big uh, the, that's the big point now tackling just the oligomers identifying just the oligomers but then um, i mean groups like uh, Ila Lashwa, they, they 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 show that uh, basically there is no confirmational specific antibody is uh, is uh, all the current antibodies they they recognize both the oligomers and the fibers so they they will not be very specific for the oligomers so now there are people that are generating like um, like devices for oligomer oligomeric species. So if, if, we, if this type of technology goes ahead, maybe we can start to do also the, on the clinical side, we can start to look into early diagnosis uh, from blood, blood cells and, uh, and a non-invasive, uh, not too invasive uh, type of measurement. Uh, but I agree that the MRI uh, will start to show some fibers only in the late stage um, because um, uh, the sensitivity is not enough to just show just very tiny amount of fiber. So you need to accumulate a lot of them. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, we move on to the next, uh, next question, which is from uh, Rossella Di Giaimo. Rossella. So first of all, uh, very thanks for this very exciting talk. I have more a curiosity because, I mean, I'm working on a protein that is involved in, a, in epilepsy, EPM1. It's also a protein that is aggregate prone. And I was wondering if you know that this synuclein is involved also in the biology of other vesicles, like, for example, exosome. Uh, sorry, uh, can you, uh, the, the last question you said, so it's involved in other vesicles like? Like exosomes. Exosome, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of studies on uh, exosomal uh, um, uh, presence of uh, synuclein. Um, yeah. the, the, um, the, the, there is this type of evidence. Uh, and in fact, I mean, exosomes is, uh, I mean, there is a lot of uh, um, still a debate about the, the, the spread of synuclein from one year to another. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. actually exosomal, uh, uh, spread of the aggregates uh, from one urine. So they, they will be basically exocytosis to exosomes and then being able to attack other, other um, uh, neurons uh, um, uh, to this mechanism. There are evidences for that. So uh, it's probably involved into the way by which the, the disease would spread across uh, different parts of the brain or different uh, neuronal population. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, are there any, any other questions? In the meantime, I would like to ask a question. 
which is about um, solid state LMR. And I'm, I'm not a structural biologist at all. I, and I was wondering how, that, how is that comparing to cryo electron microscopy, which nowadays is really yeah. awesome, I guess. Yeah, so, so I mean, the, 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 so, so I think that the, these com techniques are complementary. We, we, I mean, if you want to study something that is uh, very dynamical, and uh, very heterogeneous. And, and in this particular case uh, of uh, aggregation and uh, misfolding, uh, is, it is very often the case. Then um, you will find difficulties with CRYM. Um, in the terms of uh, big things, structure things, CRYM, now I, I would say that CRYM has beaten uh, um, uh, solid state and MR. So, uh, like in the past, I mean, up to uh, four years ago, roughly, uh, when uh, a particular method of CRIM of helical reconstruction was, uh, was made to, to do high resolution structures of amyloids, the only way by which you could have a high resolution structure of an amyloid was uh, solid state. Um, nowadays, even being a, a, a solid state NMR guy, I would, I would never use any more solid state to do a uh, structure of a uh, fibre for the simple reason that it's long process and it, can, it comes very useful and very quick with, with the cryon. Although the two techniques can be used together and you can increase the resolution if you use both of them. Um, but I think the, the, the part of the protein space where NMR in general and also solid state will never be um, beaten by other techniques is when you talk about disorder. Uh, because um, the, the, the advantage of these techniques that you're not limited by disorder, you still see the, the resonances, you, see, you still can do interactions even at the transient level. And that's why in my personal interest of protein disorder and transient interaction, NMR remains the main technique to, to employ. So, but do, do you need the, the uh, purified proteins to, protein to do this? That, that, um, unfortunately, that's one of the limitations of NMR. Uh, I mean, there are two big, big limitations you would see in literature in NMR. One is the size. And that's pre primarily a limitation for solution NMR. When you go into the solid state, you don't have any more the size limitation. The other limitation is you need the uh, isotopic enrichment. So you need uh, uh, carbon 13 and nitrogen 15. So that means we cannot really take an ex vivo amyloid and put it in an NMR um, um, tube and, and doing experiments, even at solid state or in solution, um, unless we had uh, somehow isotopically enriched the patient. But that's that's not possible. I mean, the people do this with plants and also also mice. You can do uh, by giving a diet that is uh, enriched in this uh, in this. But, but of course, with human, it's not possible. One thing that uh, people have been able, at least in amyloid field, to circumvent this problem problem is using seeding. So they took seeds from the brain and uh, incubated with uh, um, with the uh, labeled uh, recombinant protein. And then basically the, the fibers coming out of these seeds would, would have the same structure of the, of, the, of the seeds, but would be labeled. And then people have been able to do structures of uh, amyloid ex vivo using these seeding techniques. Um, but of course, yeah, so every technique has its limitation. Yeah. One thing I'd like to add for the uh, neighbors community is that we have just uh, installed the solid state. That's what I was wondering. In our department, we are just right now running the, experiments of uh, alpha synopian fibers. So um, it would be great if uh, everybody is interested in this technique. Uh, um, um, it would be great to, to start collaboration. You're welcome to use our spectrometer. And it looks like uh, I, I see that you've been uh, um, interacting with, with many people in, in Italy and it's time to uh, set up some Neapolitan collaboration yes. Yes. also with cell biologists, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, for I mean, microscopy. Yeah. Yeah. And so well, we'll talk later about the microscope because we yeah. have a facility here. Um, so if there are no other questions, it's almost two o'clock. So we thank you very much for your, uh, for your speech. It was wonderful. And thank you all for again. participating. And um, so I talk to you in we may, a few we minutes. May. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Great. Wonderful. Bye, Bye. all.